Yes guys, welcome back to another video. Welcome to the George Benson Football Channel for a highly requested video. It's the international break. This could be a long one again. Get yourself a beverage. I've gone for the H2O, the nice clean and healthy water option today. We're going to be going through my top 20 Chelsea players of my lifetime. Thinking back to memories when I was a kid, the players who I remember even before Roman Abramovich took over at Chelsea and we started to win trophies. A lot of these players are players who have some of my fondest yet oldest footballing memories attached to. A lot of the players are going to be players from the past 10-15 years because of course the younger you are the less you remember. That's just common sense in life about anything but I will give you guys a little bit of background first of all as to how I really got into football, how I got into supporting Chelsea. When I was a kid, I had copious amounts of these things, often a little bit bigger, A4 size. What I would do is I would create my own football in leagues and I had a system where a triangle on the page was a draw, a circle was a win and an X was a loss and I'd make my own leagues. I'd have a bingo machine where I'd stick 64 teams in there or 128 in the first round of the FA Cup. And I would create my own FA Cup, I'd roll dice and then whatever number was on the dice would be the score, and then at the end of it, I would have a season where you got your Champions League completed. We even did a World Cup where we played live matches in my friend's garden in his house in Cornwall. I was obsessed with football, and in accordance to being obsessed with football, when you're a kid, you have a team. You become affiliated to a team for a variety of different reasons. These days, a lot of it comes down to who's winning. Back then, particularly, my dad was a massive, massive Chelsea fan. Before I was born, he was going up and down the country following Chelsea, Leeds away, everything. He did it all. At home games as well, but when I was a kid, he didn't take me to away games because it was a little bit too, well, you know, things can happen at away games and I'm sure my old man didn't want to sink back into any of his old habits. So I go to Stamford Bridge a hell of a lot when I was a kid. And then of course, when I became an adult and I started to make my own money, I would spend a lot of that going to Chelsea games too because it was the thing that I loved the most. It's the thing that now has become my job talking about this football club, which I will always be eternally grateful to you guys for even bothering to tune into one video, let alone every single one if you're a big fan here of GBFC. If you're not a fan yet of GBFC, I'd like to ask you to subscribe. I try and do my best to bring you all of the Chelsea information that we need. But without any further ado, we're going to begin with number 20. And number 20 is a player that's not been a Chelsea player for that long. Well, he has actually been a Chelsea player for as long as he's ever known, but he's not been in the first team for that long. But it goes to show just how special this current crop of players are. That when I really narrowed this down, and I had about 50 players that I have memories with since I've been alive that have played for Chelsea, and to narrow it down to 20 of my favourites in order was so difficult. But Reese James comes in at number 20. It's a story with so many of the academy players that came through. The year that Frank Lampard took over as manager, when Eden Hazard, our best player for the past five years previous, was taken out of this team, sold to Real Madrid. Chelsea have a transfer ban, an inexperienced manager, but the biggest legend the club's ever had. Little, little caveat for later. Frank Lampard is the manager, and then you see these players and you see like, ah, he did a good job at Wigan, but is Rhys James going to be able to step up and do it for Chelsea? Absolutely no doubts. Rhys James has been phenomenal since he broke into this team, and... He was also in the side that provided me with one of the best moments of my life, which was seeing Chelsea lift the Champions League for a second time. Against all of the odds, Rhys James is part of that, and I think his story is one that I absolutely adore. You see his reaction when he scored the goal against Ajax, exactly what it means to be in the Chelsea first team, to be contributing to things, and then to become a Champions League winner within two seasons at your boyhood club. It is the stuff that dreams are made of. And I think there are a couple of players here that come from the academy that have only been in the Chelsea first team for two seasons or so. And I think that, again, it is something that is an absolute joy with the current crop of Chelsea players that we have that in such a short space of time, they've provided us with so many beautiful memories. But we move into number 19 and we fly back a little bit to the days of Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. Now, this guy... I remember he scored, I think, one of the first goals I ever saw live at Stamford Bridge. I think Ida Johnson scored the first goal that I ever saw live at Stamford Bridge. But when I was a kid, when I was playing football, I was a goalkeeper. There's a story to come later on in this video for that one. So, you know, make sure that tea's ready because we could be here all day. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, I've actually been fortunate enough to grace 
the Stamford Bridge pitch with Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. He was on my team, which was good because I don't think I'd have wanted to play against Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank because he's a big lad, you know, and that left foot of his back in the day, that goal he scored against United, I think even half of Old Trafford was like, blimey. You know, I wouldn't have been, want to have been on the side of that one, you know. You want to play bumsies with a game of headers and volleys with Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank? I don't think you do, mate. He's going to give you a sore one. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, powerful player, scored some wonderful goals. And in terms of some of my oldest memories of following Chelsea, it was always Hasselbank, Zola, Good Johnson. And we move into number 18, and it is Ida Good Johnson again. First player that I ever saw at Stamford Bridge score a hat trick. I think it was either against Blackburn or Aston Villa. I can't remember exactly, but I'll get it up on the screen for you guys now. If you're at the game, let me know. It was one of my first games I actually went to that I can remember. There are a few that I just don't remember because I was so young. I'm 27 now, but, you know, when you're a kid, there's some things that you do remember, some things that you don't. But in more recent times, Idega Johnson, I interviewed him before the FA Cup final against Arsenal, the year that we lost with Chelsea TV, and unfortunately, all of the content we shot around that day never got posted because we lost the cup final, which was a little bit frustrating, but Ida Johnson, lovely bloke. I remember when me and my dad would go, he'd always be there up front. My dad absolutely loved him. Ida stopped and spoke to both of us off camera as well, which was really nice to go to the football, to take my dad to an FA Cup final, to meet one of the players that we saw on so many occasions when I really was that little nipper, was nice. And Idega Johnson had to be on this list for me. We move into number 17. And this one might surprise a few of you, but I've made it absolutely no secret here on GBFC that one of my favourite Chelsea players ever since he broke into the team has been Ruben Loftus-Cheek. And again, I have personal stories with some of the players in this list, which certainly make my judgments a little bit easier because, of course, this is my top 20. Let me know your top 20 in the comments below. But what I loved about Ruben was, again, similar to Rhys James and various other Chelsea Academy graduates. The fact that he's been at the club for so long, he has, in terms of the overall Chelsea career that Ruben has had, he's had to be incredibly patient to build back up from that injury that we saw when Maurizio Sarri was manager, when we really believed that Ruben Loftus-Cheek was ready to be a Chelsea mainstay forever. We didn't think he was going to go anywhere. He still hasn't gone anywhere, but it was so sad when he got that injury. And I remember some explosive performances in the early days when Ruben came in. You see this real physical midfielder who can do pretty much everything. And I think ever since I interviewed him for one of the FIFA launches at West Ham Stadium a few years back, I've always loved Ruben. Again, one of those players where in front of the camera, he was receptive to my questions. And then off camera as well, he was just a bit of a legend. And I think that Ruben Loftus-Cheek now, under Thomas Tuchel, I couldn't be any more delighted that he's being given another shot at Chelsea. We move into number 16, Carlo Cudicini. Now, for those of you that are old enough to remember Carlo Cudicini, i got a personal story about Carlo Cudicini because... When I was a footballer, when I was a kid, I was a goalkeeper. The reason I was a goalkeeper wasn't entirely through choice because my dad was the manager of our football team when I was a child. And it was one of the six-a-side tournaments. If you're English, you know that when the season's done, when you're a kid, you play six-a-side tournaments. This one was in Tadley Kaliva. My team was called Thatcham Tornadoes. We we're at one tournament and the goalkeeper decided he didn't want to play anymore. And his dad said that he didn't want his son to play in goal because it was raining. That was the end of him. Never played for our team ever again. But of course, as the son of the manager of the team and you're there in a tournament with no bloody goalkeeper, guess who got lumbered in goal? It was me. And uh, I wouldn't say I was great at it, but I wasn't bad at it. That's for sure. We got to the semi-final of that tournament, I believe. And I only conceded one goal throughout the entire tournament. And I think I played four matches. So from that point, I was destined to be the goalkeeper. We had a decent side for... You know, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think I stopped when I was 14. At those kind of ages, we had a very, very good team. And yeah, my dad was the manager. He absolutely loved it. I loved doing it with my dad. He was just as passionate as I was about winning. And I ended up being the keeper. And Carlo Cudicini was my nickname because obviously I supported Chelsea. Carlo Cudicini was number one at the time. And yeah, it always stuck with me. I remember going to France with my grandmother and we went to a sports shop in Calais and I bought this pair of gloves that you guys can see on the screen now. And I think I broke them within about five months. And then I went back to France with my nan again and we got some more. Absolutely loved Carlo Cudicini. I'll always fondly remember him at Chelsea. And we move into number 15. And again, this is a personal one mainly for me. 
David Luiz. I had the absolute pleasure to interview David Luiz at Cobham two years ago for BT Sport before the season kicked off. We talked through the predictor that BT Sport had conducted for where the Premier League table was going to look like. David Luiz, one of the nicest footballers, if not the nicest footballer that I've ever met. In terms of his personality and characteristics in the Chelsea dressing room, always one that the younger players looked up to. And of course, he was a Champions League winner. Despite signing for Arsenal, I cannot look anything other than fondly at David Luiz's time at Chelsea. And I keep in touch with him now. We Instagram DM once in a while. Gave him best wishes wishes when he went to Flamengo. And I just think overall, when David Luiz looks back on his career, I'm sure that he would say his time at Chelsea was, or both of his times at Chelsea were two of his favourite spells of his career. We move into number 14, Michael Essien. There was no way that this man could not make the list. I was delighted a couple of months ago because I randomly got followed on Twitter by Michael Essien. It is one of the perks of making these Chelsea videos once in a while. You get a bit closer to some of those heroes that I've grown up with, which again is like an, one of those things I don't talk about very often. But as a Chelsea fan, making these videos is kind of a subsidiary to that. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing is Chelsea winning. And yeah, little things like that just make the whole connection for me that much deeper and stronger. But when I look back to Michael Essien's time at Chelsea, there were so many moments of just pure magic. The goal against Arsenal at Stamford Bridge. But number one for me was that absolutely sensational weak foot, left foot volley that he scored against Barcelona. I've got the dog here. He's having a bit of a Barney next to me. He's like, how have you put Essien so far down the list? What do you want, Mace? What do you want? He wants absolutely nothing but to buy himself. Essien, what a player he was. The injustice that was that day against Barcelona when Chelsea deserved to make the Champions League final for the second consecutive year. But Michael Essien, what a player he was. He was nicknamed the Bison at Chelsea for a long time. He even played for Bali United, which is, you guys know I live in Bali. Played for Bali United for a little bit too, which is kind of cool. Michael Essien's in at number 14. We move into one of the hardest tacklers the Premier League has ever seen, Ricardo Carvalho. Now, Man United fans will sit here arguing all day long that Rio Ferdinand ex Nemanja Vidic were the best centre-back partnership to ever grace the Premier League. I will sit here and argue until the cows come home that John Terry and Ricardo Carvalho were in fact the best centre-back partnership the Premier League's ever seen. 15 goals conceded in a Premier League season. What I loved about Ricardo Carvalho was not only he'd come up with amazing goals once in a while, you remember the one against Spurs, but the slide tackles, man. Even at Real Madrid, Carvalho with a slide tackle, there are not many better players I can ever remember during my lifetime that could put in such a big, clean slide tackle like Carvalho. He was a legend and he's won the Premier League with us a couple of times. He had to be in this list. We move into number 12 and it's kind of low for Ashley Cole to be down in number 12. But again, I've got so many rational reasons for the players above him. And in terms of, I'm a very emotive football fan. Like I, I sit even when games aren't on and I dwell and try and bring up emotions from games, be it resentment when I watch back the highlights of the Barcelona game, sadness when you watch John Terry slip when we lost to Manchester United. I love bringing stuff like this back up again because I'm so emotionally invested in football. And for Ashley Cole, I think when he was a Chelsea player, this is going to sound bad, but I don't really think I appreciated just how good he was until he left, which has been the case for quite a few players at Chelsea, to be honest. And Ashley Cole would be much further up the list in terms of like prominent, great Chelsea players, I think, of the past 20 years, or at least in my lifetime. Number 12, I feel like it should be higher and Ashley Cole, if you're watching this video, probably not, but if you ever stumble across it on the internet, then I bloody love you. And I wish at the time I really understood just how good you were. We move into number 11. And again, you guys might think I'm a fool here because Mason Mount hasn't been a Chelsea player for anywhere near as long as Ashley Cole was in terms of first team football. But Mason Mount is the epitome in my eyes. And it's like the way that I merge my feelings together about what Chelsea have achieved in the past three years I think Mason Mount is kind of the, the spearhead of all of that. When we think about the best days of my life, I talk about when we won the Champions League in May 2012, when we won the Champions League this year in 2012, Mason Mount got that assist for Kai Havertz to score that goal. And everything that Mason Mount represents, to me, is what Chelsea Football Club is all about. We've got the best academy in the world, and Mason Mount was given an opportunity by our best ever player, 
broke into the team and now we see just how important and how good this guy is. I love the way he conducts himself in interviews. I love the way that he integrates with all of the players within the squad. I think his personality is just as important to Chelsea as what he does with the football on the pitch. And he gets into number 11. I'm sure if I was to update this video in a few years time, he's going to be even higher up the list. He's a Champions League winner too. We move into number 10. Now, number 10 is Joe Cole. Now, if you haven't been a Chelsea fan for that long, I highly recommend that you go on YouTube and you search for Joe Cole highlight reels. This guy was a magician. He was absolutely sensational. I remember again, bringing back an old story, me and my dad, we'd go to the Millennium Hotel for a beer just before games. I remember I just turned 18 or, you know, I might have been 17, underage drinking, never me. But... We met Joe Cole's dad and he stopped and chatted to us for about 35, 40 minutes in the Millennium Hotel. And to be honest, when you watch Joe Cole on TV, he's just like his father. And I think the best thing for me about Joe Cole is the personality of the lad is just infectious. You know, the way he talks about Chelsea Football Club now, the way he celebrated that Champions League win back in May in the BT Sports studio, he's going absolutely bonkers. The same as any other fan in the stadium. Not only that, but he scored massive goals for Chelsea. You know, the one against United, which cemented our place as back-to-back -back Premier League winners. He was a magician on the ball. So many moments of magic. And he will always go down, in my book, and I'm thinking everyone else's too, as a Chelsea legend. We move into number nine, Claude McAlealy. Now, this guy was magnificent. You know, in terms of the midfield role that he had, there's a reason why football named the McAlealy role the McAlealy roll. I remember he took a penalty against Charlton and I remember being like just praying that he was going to score because the man never scored goals. He missed the penalty and then he converts the rebound. Praise the Lord. Claude McAlealy was a sensational footballer. Jose Mourinho always says that he was the missing piece in the jigsaw to make Chelsea win back-to-back -back Premier Leagues. And ever since he signed, he was magnificent for Chelsea. He was so important to the way that we played. He was the anchor in the midfield, such a gracious footballer, and he had to make the top 10. Moving into number eight. Now, as a goalkeeper myself, I think there are very few people in the goalkeeping world who could deny that one of the best goalkeepers there's ever been is Petr Cech. I'm not going to say he's the best goalkeeper there has ever been in history, but for me, he's got to be right up there. And I'm sure for a lot of you guys too. Petr Cech, what a man this guy is. From coming outside of Stamford Bridge, talking to the fans when the Super League debacle was going on, to the phenomenal debut save he made against Manchester United, when we got a glimpse of the absolute goalkeeping genius of Petr Cech that we would see at Chelsea for so, so long. Yes, he went to Arsenal, but for me, it means nothing. Petr Cech was sensational. In the prime years of his career, there wasn't anybody better. And the Champions League final, as much as we attribute everything to Didier Drogba and everything else, Petr Cech saves. Man, he went the right way for every single penalty. What a Chelsea hero Petr Cech is. And again, any of these players from this point on could easily be the top one. Because every single person we're about to mention now has had such a big impact on my life, on the history of Chelsea Football Club, that this order is entirely up to your interpretation, but I've had to try and narrow it down. Number seven, Diego Costa. It's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Mr. Diego Costa. I absolutely loved Diego Costa. I still love Diego Costa. He is an absolute one of a kind in terms of the way that his brain works and the way that he would get underneath the skin of opponents was arguably just as important to win Chelsea points as what he actually did with the football. You know, Diego Costa won Chelsea so many points during his time at the club with, with game-changing goals and moments of brilliance. But the way he got under the skin is something as a passionate fan, and I'm an emotive, passionate fan, as you guys know, I loved it. When Diego Costa would be there riling up the opposition, forcing bookings out of opponents and getting in the faces of players, it's something special. The goals he'd score against Arsenal as well He's just immense. You know, I think we cannot underestimate just how good Diego Costa was at his time at Chelsea Football Club. It's a shame he fell out with Antonio Conte, but he will always go down as one of my favourite ever Chelsea players. We move into the first player that I had on the back of my shirt when I was a kid. It was the Autoglass shirt, Gianfranco Zola. This guy 
is regarded by many, and especially the older Chelsea fans amongst us here will probably agree with this, as Chelsea's most talented ever player. A lot would argue it's Eden Hazard. But Gianfranco Zola, for his height, and the Premier League was a very physical league at this point in time. And Gianfranco Zola just had this way mesmerizing, if not hypnotizing, defenders. And he would just destroy people. He'd sit them down on their backside. I remember Jamie Carragher being on his ass. Gianfranco Zola was just wonderful. If you go on YouTube again and just search for Gianfranco Zola highlights, you'll be like, he's like Messi. Messi is Zola reincarnated. What a bold statement that is, Benson. But Gianfranco Zola was something special. Had him on the back of my shirt. He was the first player that I ever loved at Chelsea Football Club. We move into number five. And again, this now, is, I, I just smile when I make this video. It's such a nice video to make because it reminds me of all of the glorious moments that we've had as Chelsea fans over the years. Didier Drogba. This order could surprise some of you or I hope you understand each reason why. Didier Drogba, what is there to say other than if ever Chelsea could thank an individual for all of the trophies we have in those specific moments in game-defining or tournament-defining matches, the final, Didier Drogba was the man for the occasion. There is nobody better to call upon, in my opinion, maybe you could argue Ronaldo, but in the history of football, I would say Didier Drogba is Mr. Final. If you need someone to turn up with a moment of just pure sheer brilliance, you give Didier Drogba a call. I almost met him in Moscow in 2018 at the World Cup. He had security guards. I was supposed to meet him after he did a little five-a-side that he was doing. And then the Qatari prince came. And then all the security guards went to the Qatari prince. Drogba had to leave. And I never got to meet the geezer. I was very, very gutted about that. And then England lost in the semi-final too. So it was all round. Bit of a shambolic trip. Didier Drogba was number five. That goal, that penalty, it is glorious. It is absolutely glorious to relive. Number four, Chelsea's greatest ever captain, John Terry. Now, JT, there is, in my opinion, there's no better defender in the history of the Premier League than John Terry. There's definitely no greater captain in the history of our football club than John Terry. This man was Mr. Chelsea. He wore his heart on his sleeve. He would put his head in front of football boots to defend Chelsea's goal to make us win football matches. John Terry was actually a brilliant footballer, as well as being a warrior. Some of the passing range that this guy had in his locker is just the joy to behold, you know, weak foot passes, diagonals across the pitch, last ditch defending. John Terry as a captain, no matter what rival fans will say about he didn't play and he gets his shirt on, he goes and lifts the trophy, whatever. John Terry was Chelsea through and through. The interview that he gave after the Sunderland game in his last ever game, I was there, I was in floods of tears. And so were many old boys around me who were about triple my age, just in tears because this man was is Chelsea. He's not was, he is Chelsea Football Club. When he was at Aston Villa, you still see him on Instagram cheering on the blues. Little things like that are what build the affiliation that I personally have to players past and present. We move into number three. This one for me, I think you guys know who number one is already. It was between two players who got number two and three. I've given number three to Eden Hazard. I personally don't think in my lifetime I've ever witnessed so many moments of individual class as I've witnessed inside of Stamford Bridge and in various away days as I've seen with Eden Hazard. He is a player who would get you off your seat. He's a player who even on your couch at home, when he's got the ball, it doesn't matter how many after eights you are down and how fat you feel, he's making you move. Eden Hazard was simply brilliant. Some of the things that he would do, there are very few players in the world who could do what he would do. Since he left Chelsea, it's been a real shame. And I think Chelsea fans will always have a deep-rooted affiliation to Eden Hazard because he was so good, won trophies with us, and on the final game he played for the club, scores two goals against Arsenal to win us the Europa League. There is absolutely not a bad word I can say about Eden Hazard. And we move into number two. And I think this player, N'Golo Kante, is one is my second favourite footballer of all time. And, you know, I say second as in, as in there's someone more important than N'Golo Kante. But he's kind of in a class of his own, to be honest, because I don't think there's ever been such a nice guy in footballs in Golo Kante and I think even rival fans can agree with that one. I feel as though the way he plays and the way he tackles and the way he just wins everything and then you look at the size of him, he drives a Mini Cooper and the smile. Like how can anybody not love this smile? And Golo Kante isn't just a special footballer, he's a special man and since he's come to Chelsea, 
he's won all there is to win. And I just, I don't think there's a better midfielder in the world when he's when he's fit than N'Golo Kante. I think he's absolutely superb. And I don't even think he gets the... I don't even think he gets the respect he actually deserves. And I know he gets a lot of respect in the footballing world, but still, I, I don't have superlatives in my in my arsenal, in my brain, to talk anymore about how brilliant and how wonderful I think N'Golo Kante is. And he followed me on Twitter two weeks before he signed for Chelsea. So I don't know if that was a little sign or not, but if I was making Chelsea videos back then, I'd have certainly uploaded that one as a, he's coming, boys. He's coming. I'm calling it now. Number one, Super Frank. Lampard. My voice is going here. I've been talking like an absolute nutter for 26 minutes. Give me a second. Frank Lampard. Oh my goodness. I have never owned football shirts, as many as I have, with the same name on the back as Super Frank. I have met Super Frank Lampard for a split second, and I wish I could sit down for an hour and talk to Frank Lampard, because he is literally my hero. He is my childhood hero following Chelsea. He is my childhood hero as a footballer, because I think what he achieved as a midfielder, with the goals that he scored, is simply unfathomable. I think it will never be matched again in our, my lifetime in terms of a midfielder scoring that many goals, not just penalties either. And some of the memories I have, Lampard on his knees in the Champions League final, that interview he did when he's talking about his kids and Chelsea being the best club in the world. You know, there, there are little nuggets in football that you hold on to as memories that outweigh other ones, you know, like even if it's just an interview. Frank Lampard, for me, I think is responsible for as much happiness as any friend or family member that I've ever known. And as much as I've never met Frank Lampard, he, to me, is Chelsea. If I had to put Chelsea Football Club out there to an alien and describe it, I'd say Frank Lampard. I'd say John Terry. But Frank Lampard, for me, was my childhood hero. I loved him. I was ecstatic when he became Chelsea's manager and I was gutted when he was sacked and it probably was the right thing to do of course because we've now gone on and won the Champions League but I absolutely love the man and he is my favourite Chelsea player ever but anyway I've kept you for nearly another half an hour again here today I hope you've enjoyed this one it's been me chattering on about Chelsea again and you know I got a big grin on my face this has been a fun video to do I'd love for you guys to let me know your top 20 Chelsea players in the comments below and yeah, there could be honourable mentions for so many people that I'm not even going to bother. I love this club. Thank you guys for allowing me to talk about it every day. See you all later. Come on, you blue.